Natural Beauty Summits. I'm your host, Salome Salehi, founder of Sugar Sugar Wax. And this here is my co-host, Angela Chong, founder of M-Beauty. Now, we have a really, really special treat for you, which is the baby box. So some of the experts that you guys have been listening to throughout this series are have contributed some products for you to test out if your mommy baby or mommy baby combo or for um, if you know any mothers to be who are on that journey this is a great little box for them to try some amazing non-toxic products but before we go any further Angela tell us about our guest so today we're talking with Nicole Walker Nicole is a board certified coach and a licensed counselor. She specializes in helping clients understand their attachment styles and feel more confident so that they can build solid foundations and long-term habits to attract and keep the relationships that they want. Now, I have to say, I have been in a loving relationship for too many years to count. However, I was really surprised by my own attachment style. So whether you're struggling in relationships or you're in a great relationship, there's always room for improvement and a great relationship starts with a great relationship with yourself and the basis of that is knowing yourself. So stay tuned and learn all about your attachment style in my conversation with Nicole Walker. Welcome back to Natural Beauty Summit's Love and Babies, A Health Journey. I'm excited to be talking with Nicole Walker, who is a counselor and a coach who specializes in relationships and most specifically on attachment styles. So I'm super excited to have this conversation with her. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Let's dive right into it. now. You're the attachment expert. And I went through your quiz and I was kind of surprised actually by my own findings. Um, and I found that I'm kind of almost like balanced on two of the styles, um, almost in equal parts. So what I wanted to get from you and just to kind of start us off is, can you tell us a little bit about the different attachment styles and what you tend to see together. Yeah, totally. Um, And if it's all right with you, I might back up a little further to just even identify what an attachment style is, because I think that, you know, we've heard those buzzwords a lot of attachment style or attachment theory. Um, So to just kind of like bring it back to the beginning. So this is based in psychological research. Um, You know, it's not just something that someone willy nilly, you know, made up. Um, It was created by a psychologist in the 1950s named John Bowlby. And uh, his bulk of research looked at, you know, how your caregivers responded to your needs in the very early years of your life impacted your relationships into adulthood and beyond, right? So that's really what he looked at. So that's kind of attachment in a nutshell is it's impacted by how your caregivers are able to respond to your needs. And I use that word caregiver intentionally because, you know, it's whoever raised you. It doesn't have to be your biological parents. Um, And what he found is that there are four different attachment styles. So there's a secure attachment style, which we're all kind of striving for and want. And then there's three insecure attachment styles. And under that umbrella are avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. So secure attachment is formed if you have a caregiver who is reliable, responds to your needs, creates an environment of safety and stability, right? Like the child learns, like when I cry or when I'm hungry or when I want to hug, like my caregiver is going to be there, right? And that reliability Uh, creates a lot of trust in the child and they grow up to be secure and relationships feel pretty easy for them. 
Um, but if that doesn't happen, we get one of the other styles. So anxious, a lot of times is formed if you have a caregiver who is only sometimes available, meaning, you know, sometimes they're there and very supportive, but other times they could be critical or cold. So that feeling of like, exactly, very inconsistent. And that feeling of, you know, I never know what I'm going to get creates a lot of anxiety in the child. Um, and then avoidant attachment is formed if you have a caregiver who's just not really emotionally responsive, shuts down your emotional expression. Um, and we only keep doing things if they work, right? So if we learn, like I keep going to my parent when I'm upset and they shut me down, we are going to stop doing that, right? And in a lot of ways, your emotional system shuts down. Or we see avoidant attachment if you have a caregiver who kind of parentifies their child, right? Leans on their child for their own emotional support. And then the child learns closeness with others equates to an abandonment of myself, right? Like when I'm close with someone else, there's not really any room for my needs, right? Um, and then lastly, we have disorganized attachment. And that is created when the, you know, source of safety becomes a source of fear. So the child gets really disorganized and confused because there's perceived fear without solutions, right? Um, and that individual will exhibit kind of traits of anxious and avoidant uh, styles. So, I mean, that's a very brief overview, yeah. um, but I hope that answers your question. And that's kind of the four attachment styles in a nutshell. Yeah, that was great. And I think um, just for everyone to understand, I think it is really simplified because even just going through some of your material, I found that it's a lot more nuanced than, you know, that. But I think that kind yes. of paints a picture. And I think like all of us can relate to like what kind of upbringing did we have? Was there like more fear? Was there consistency? Was there inconsistency? Or was there just no emotional availability? I think that that's like kind of the baseline. So like, when you work with people, I mean, can people be more than one style? Not really. I think a lot of people want to be more than one style. Yeah, right? don't tell me that. <laughs> um, but I think it's really looking at like how you show up most of the time. Um, and like a mistake that I see a lot of people make is thinking they're anxiously attached when they're actually avoidantly attached. Um, and why I say that is because, um, you know, avoidantly attached individuals sometimes get a bad rap of being cold and, you know, emotionless and, you know, just not caring and all this stuff. But, you know, it's really interesting. So in addition to John Bowlby, another really big, like, key player in attachment work was this woman um, named Mary Ainsworth. And she came up with something called the strange situation experiment. Right. And basically it was an experiment where you'd have an infant and you'd have the mother and a stranger and those two players, the mom and the stranger would kind of come and leave the room and they would see how this kid would respond. And the avoidantly attached infant just didn't really have any reaction, right? So everyone thought like, oh, this kid is just shut down their emotional system. They just don't care. You know, they're just completely blase to this mom and stranger. But when they added physiological measures to the experiment, they actually found that the avoidantly attached infant had higher levels of anxiety than any of the other kids, uh, you know, with the other attachment styles. So I bring that up to say, I think a lot of people make the mistake that like, well, I'm having this anxiety in my relationship, I must be anxiously attached. But the big difference is how that anxiety is expressed, right? Because someone with anxious attachment, it's, you know, more of an external processing of that, right? It's very outwardly shown, right? They'll engage in something called protest behaviors. So if they feel anxious in a relationship, like they're like a dog with a bone, like they're texting, they're calling, like they're going to, you know, try so hard to get their needs met where someone avoidantly attached is still going to be super anxious, but you're just not going to see that on the outside, right? They're an in internal processor. It's a much more internal experience. Um, so 
yes, I just bring that up because I see that so commonly that that's a mistake. Um, but the other quick thing that I'll add is if you get, you know, just so caught up into like, I don't know, maybe I'm disorganized, maybe I'm avoidant. Like, I think it's really helpful and more simplified to just look at, is this behavior that I'm exhibiting, is it falling under the secure camp or the insecure camp? Mm -hmm. Is this helpful in moving me towards my relationship goals or not so helpful, you know? And more focus on that if you're really, you know, confused as to like what specific attachment style you are. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that because I definitely thought, well, I have a little bit of this and I have a little bit of that and it kind of feels like equal parts. But just listening to you say that, I think um, part of that was more wishful thinking and maybe like, you know, as you kind of grow up and you learn and you, you know, take on these adaptive behaviors, we're like moving more towards that like secure attachment. <laughs> um, so you're like, yeah, I'm totally like half secure attached and half something else like anxious or whatever. Um, so thank you for clarifying that now, like just kind of to go back to that, are there types, are there attachment types that tend to attract one another? Yes. Um, so, <laughs> and, you know, I do want to say as well that like your attachment style, like these are not fixed things, right? Like if you're born anxious, like you can totally become secure. Like, I don't want this to be this fatalistic message that like, you're oh no, oh girl, we're that. getting to that. That's my next okay. question. Don't you <laughs> yeah. Like, so I just really want to like make sure yeah. that, um, yeah you know, that is very loud and clear. Um, but going back to your question about like what attachment styles kind of, um, you know, are attracted to each other is a lot of times we see secure and secure matchup, right? Because secure individuals, they're great communicators. They don't play any games. They want commitment. Um, so naturally those two are a really good match. Um, we don't really, when we see anxious and anxious come together, it's like fireworks and a big flame that goes out very quickly, right? Because it's yeah. really hard to sustain, sustain something if both people are engaging in kind of those protest behaviors I referenced and stuff like that. So it's usually like this hot and heavy, intense thing that burns out really quickly. Um, and then when we have avoidant and avoidant come together, never really gets anywhere, never really gets off the ground because you have two people that don't really want to be close, right? Or it's, you know, I've worked with people, um, you know, avoidant and avoidant pairings where it's like they've been together for 10 years, but there's been no movement on the relationship, right? Like they still don't live together. And I'm not saying like, you know, that has to be the goal for everyone, but just to speak to the point that, you know, they found themselves in a relationship where they can have all these walls and barriers up, right? Yeah. Um, but another common pairing that we often see, uh, which can be very tumultuous and difficult, is the anxious and avoidant pairing. These two are like a moth to a flame. Think, you know, Carrie and Big from Sex and the City, um, Blair and God, what is his name? I'm thinking of Ed Westwood, but that's not his name in Gossip Girl. Chuck, Chuck, uh, Blair and Chuck in Gossip Girl, right? Like you see this push pull dynamic, right? Like the anxious person keeps on trying to get closer. The avoidant individual keeps pulling away. And then when they think they're going to lose the person, they come in a little bit, right? So it's just this back and forth, back and forth. So, so much work. <laughs> So much work, so much energy. I've worked with so many couples and individuals and anxious and avoidant pairings, and we see it all the time. I bet. There's a way I, to get I'm out sure of it. I've been in at least one relationship like that. <laughs> oh, I, I've been in many myself. <laughs> so what about um, the fourth one? The disorganized disorganized do disorganized and disorganized ever come together or are they too all over the place to recognize that there's an opportunity here 
Yeah, I mean, we don't see disorganized as much because, you know, research tells us that it's only about 5% of the population. So it's not, you know, as apparent out there in the dating world as other styles. Um, but what we see sometimes with disorganized is, you know, individuals who uh, have like true disorganized attachment have often been victims of or have witnessed abuse. So like they nine times out of 10 have some kind of trauma history, right? Which really needs to be addressed by like a licensed therapist. Like that's why I always, you know, really encourage those individuals to partner with a licensed therapist so they can start to rebuild that trust and stability and all of that. But I say that to say that sometimes we see them pair in like a codependent bond, right? Because well, if someone come in who's like, oh, I'll save you, you know, you've had this harried past and like, I'll come in and make it better. And that doesn't work either, right? Because I mean, we don't need to go into why codependent dynamics don't work, but it's just, you know, this constant power differential and the, these over-functioner, under-functioner dynamics that don't really lend to creating the foundation for a long-lasting relationship. Interesting. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about how, you know, your attachment style isn't like permanent by any means. I actually really noticed that about your work is um, you know, so often we get these messages from like society, from research, from books that like, oh, like if this is your past or your childhood and this is whatever, like your style, then you're broken and it's like permanent because you're never going to be go able to go back to, you know, your six year old self and re repair whatever happened. Right. And uh, you take a really, really different approach, which was so refreshing which was like, you know what, you can like, literally, like, this is the impression I got is like, you can overcome anything, nothing in terms of your attachment style, your how you show up in relationships is permanent. And um, I'd love for you to just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, you're not stuck with the attachment style that you know, was formed um, when you were a child. And I also want to say too, no one is a hundred percent securely attached, right? Like we all got a little bit of something. We all get triggered by, you know, something. So, you know, this idea that we are like aiming for perfection, we're not right. Um, but, you know, to like briefly speak from my own experience, you know, I, because of my childhood and the dynamics were there that were there, I really, really struggled with avoidant attachment. Um, and, you know, had a string of unhealthy relationships in my 20s. And uh, when I got to be in my late 20s, and, you know, all my friends were getting married and all that, you know, and I got to 30, and I was still single, I was like, okay, maybe we got to look at like what we're contributing to these dynamics. Um, and I put in a lot of work to work on myself. Um, and I got married last fall and I'm with someone who's very securely attached. Um, so that was something that really helped me was, you know, we can also really move towards secure attachment by pairing with someone who's secure, right? And knowing what to look out for there. Um, but I think as well, because of, you know, the childhood that I grew up in and my previous relationships, like this earned secure attachment that I feel like I now have, I feel like I appreciate that so much more because A, I worked so dang hard for it. Yeah. And B, because, you know, I know what's on the other side, you know, like love my husband, but I don't think he knows what it could be like. <laughs> like he doesn't know <laughs> what a really unhealthy um, relationship could be. So you know, that's what I try and teach a lot of my uh, clients is that whatever kind of relationship you want, you can have it. And there is a roadmap to get you there. Wow. But I mean, getting even to that point of like, what do I want? Um, like that requires some work. No. Yeah, no, it does. Because I think a lot of people, um, 
are so kind of starting from square one, right? Like have had no healthy role models of love. Like what's a healthy relationship? I don't know, you know? And I actually have um, a free mini course that goes into kind of like how you can create your own relational role model and what that process looks like. Because myself and so many people I've worked with are like, I don't even know where to start. So I think that really looks like, taking an inventory of what your needs are, you know, what you want that relationship to look like, looking at, you know, movie, uh, movies, TV, books, like, you know, relationships that when you see them, or, you know, even if it's through friends or coworkers, just, you know, a relationship, you observe it, and you're like, oof, I want that, like, I want you to start tracking those things, you know, so there is a process if you feel like you're starting from square one to kind of formulate where you want to reach. Yeah, I love that. And I think, um, you know, I think that for me and like, I mean, I'm married now <laughs> and happily, but um, up until that happened, I think that was probably one of the hardest things um, was like, there's ideas that I thought I had about what I wanted. I'm like, oh, I want this. And a lot of that I realized after when I got like really like honest with myself was um, a lot of it was like projections from like what my mom would want me to have or what like my parents relationship might have been like or you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's great that you offer that and guys we're totally going to leave links for you to take advantage of that. And um, what I now as a mom am really, really interested in is because, you know, it's kind of circular, like you become, you form your attachment style and become who you are because of like that kind of zero to seven childhood years um, and what your parents did. And then now you become a parent. What do you, what are, what are the patterns that you see like? when someone's attachment style is a certain way and how do they like what attachment styles do they foster in their children like is it like you know if you were really like you had a secure attachment like now you're you want to maybe foster more independence and slight of what like I don't know I'm totally guessing but you're you're the expert and you're the one that's looking at this stuff day in and day out so what is your perspective on that yeah, no, and I think that uh, I just hear from so many parents and moms, you know, they do put so much pressure on themselves to, you know, get it right and all this stuff. And um, I think there is a lot of pressure there, right, with, you know, these buzz buzzwords, attachment theory, and I don't want to give my kid an insecure attachment style and all of that, right? Um, but I think... So, you know, if you have secure attachment, you're naturally going to kind of give that and, you know, produce that in your children, right? So that's pretty- That's the gold standard. Yes, that's the gold standard. But okay. there's only about 50% of us who are in that camp, right? So I'm going to kind of more talk to the other 50%. Um, so I think some things that you can- kind of look out for and be aware of, right? Is like, if you identify with avoidant attachment, a lot of times those caregivers will impart a very like chin up attitude to their kids, right? Like, oh, it's not that bad. Come on, you know, like, let's get going. Um, and that's not really helpful, right? Like we <laughs> want to kind of create this safe holding space for your kids to have their emotional expression and for it to be acknowledged and validated. You know, Brene Brown talks about this story that I love where her daughter, I don't know, she's 13 and she's like being picked on at school, right? And the daughter comes home and she's crying to Brene and Brene's like, oh, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Like those girls, you know, just don't sit with them at lunch anymore. Like you're so much better than them, right? And her daughter was just kind of like, okay, mom, you know, and she talks about how she realized like that reaction was so much more for her than her daughter, right? Because she just didn't want to see her daughter in pain. And the next time it happened, you know, she really sat with it and was just like, I'm really sorry to hear that. You know, how does that make you feel? 
that must have been really crappy to hear those girls say that. So the lesson there is how can we sit in the muck with our kids, right? Mm -hmm. And not try and fix it, not always try and make it better, um, but to really let them have that emotional expression, be it positive or negative, right? Because also the parent who's like the toxic positivity, like, you know, you got to be happy all the time. Like, that's not good either, right? I'm not saying we need to be negative Nancy's, but really just kind of sitting with whatever they're bringing to the table. The full range of emotions. And yes, I'm really familiar with Brene's work. And I actually just finished reading Daring Greatly. Um, so good. Such a good book. And yeah, like, it's tough. Um, I guess, like, this is another thing that, you know, like I kind of want to talk about is when we like a lot of times, like our attachment is formed from like parenting and parenting is always in flux and there's always some new parenting trend. And what was, you know, like accepted and encouraged when I was a kid is not necessarily relevant anymore. It becomes like really outdated. So like, how do you navigate and what are like some of the like core pillars of fostering this secure attachment um, as a parent for your kids as you're kind of navigating through like these trends? And I, and I bring that up now because, you know, like Brene's work, it's, it's very much on trend and, uh, and, you know, when she learns something, we all learn something and she's doing it through the research and we're like, oh my gosh, this is the Holy grail. Like we're going to do it like Brene's way, but like in 10 years from now, we're going to know so much more. And we're going to look back and be like, Ooh, that maybe didn't work so well as we thought. I mean, not, I'm not, you know, pointing Brene out in this at all. I think her work is fantastic, but, um, you know, like, how do you navigate those trends? And like, like, what are the core pillars of like cultivating and fostering that secure attachment without getting caught up with the latest and greatest? Yes, yes, I have a, a lot to say on this. So, um, you know, the research when it comes to attachment theory, like this is back from the 1950s and has stuck. Right. So like to me, in for in my opinion, that has stood, you know, the test of time. Um, and something that I kind of want to start this off with is like another big player in the attachment theory space is uh, the psychologist Edward Tronic. And what he found was that, you know, if parents were able to correctly attune to their children's, you know, physical and emotional needs, 20 to 30% of the time, secure attachment could still be formed. So okay, I just say that, that very because <laughs> very realistic, right? Like, I feel like we're all like trying so hard. And like, to me, that research is just like, oh, right. Like I only need to get it right, perfectly right. 20 to 30% of the time. And my kid's still going to have secure attachment. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and what he focuses on that word attunement that I just mentioned is there's a very big difference between attunement and presence, right? So presence is like, you're just physically around, mm -hmm. right? But that's not the same. You're caregiver being physically around. I mean, they could be drunk, passed out on the couch, right? Like that's not really doing anything to attune to your needs. Um, and what I mean by attunement is when you go to your parent and you're upset, right? Or, you know, you're an infant and you reach out for a hug or you cry, like all those moments of just being tuned into and acknowledging, um, you know, that baby's physical, emotional their needs, that is what really creates secure attachment over time. Um, and the reason why I love that statistic too, is because 100% is not the goal. 
And why I say that is because sometimes we see parents who run a little more anxious are like so up in their kid's business with the absolute best of intentions. Like I'm not knocking this. Like I know that it comes from a very good place, but that's really important for a kid to have that space to self-soothe, right? For the parent to get it right sometimes, for the parent maybe not to be there, for them to like work through that. Like that's normal human interaction and connection. Right. Um, You know, like when I see a kid, like one of my biggest pet peeves is when you see like a kid kind of struggling and like needing a moment maybe by themselves and like the parents or grandparents or whoever is like, give so and so a hug or like so and so wants a picture. And you just see the kid almost like physically kind of like going in on themselves. Like that's what I'm talking about. They really need that space to kind of just like self regulate for a moment. That makes so much sense. Um, I remember this because I just read the book, but like one of the things that um, Renee talks about and daring greatly in the parenthood section is about like allowing your kids to struggle and figure things out. And what you just said about the 20 to 30% makes so much sense because I think like having read that, I was like, oh my God, like, I don't know if I can let them struggle all the time. Like that defeats the purpose. And I'm thinking the, all the what ifs in my head, but like what you're saying now, like makes a lot of sense of what Brene said in her book in that you do want to tend to their needs 20 to 30% of the time, but like also letting them um, you know, letting them struggle, letting them figure it out, sitting with them without feeling like you need to make it better. Like it's really coming into like full view for me. Thank you. Um, so, you know, like we're kind of talking about two things in this relationship. I mean, we're talking about two things in this conversation and, um, you know, there's one side, we have relationships and we have parenting, um, Is there like advice that you would give to people who are like maybe just at that first part of the spectrum where they're just starting to think about like healthy, committed, long-term relationships and how to go from like chaos to love? And then does that advice also flow into the parents who are now like, oh my gosh, I'm responsible for... um, helping my kid like form their attachment style or you can give me two totally different sets of advice that's good too (laughs) yeah well I think one like global piece of advice for you know whether you're trying to become a parent you're a new parent you're you know in a relationship and don't want kid you know wherever you are on that spectrum or you're dating learning how to self-regulate and self-soothe is huge in the foundation of any healthy relationship, be it with a romantic partner or a child, right? Um, Because, you know, there's co-regulation, which is regulating with someone else, which is just as important, right? Like when you go and you give your partner like a nice long hug, that's an example of co-regulation. But a lot of us, dependent on our upbringing, never learned to self-regulate because we only learned how to co-regulate, right? Or vice versa, right? So someone anxiously attached will be great at co-regulating, but when they're by themselves are like losing it. Where someone avoidantly attached wants to do everything by themselves and has a hard time kind of sitting in that muck that we were talking about and, you know, co-regulating with someone else. So learning how to, in a healthy way, sit with your own emotional experience, right? Really, really looking at and strengthening your relationship with your inner caregiver is going to be the foundation of any relationship that you have. Because babies can't co-regulate with you unless you can self-regulate, right? It's like this weird paradox thing, right? Um, And that also, if you have children you are putting forth an amazing role model if they are witnessing you care for yourself, 
right? We don't want our kids to be looking at us and seeing that we can't handle anything on our own. And then when anything happens, you know, we're falling apart and calling someone. And da, da, da. I mean, of course, there's moments for that, right? Like, I'm not saying that that can't ever happen. But, you know, for a kid to witness you taking care of yourself, going for walks, meditating, journaling, doing art, I mean, whatever that looks like for you, I think that is a really solid foundation to build the kind of relationships you want. Wow, that is fantastic advice. And it's so simple, but so universal. Um, Now, for someone who might be watching or listening to this, and they're like, well, what does self, um, self-soothing or self-regulation, what does that look like? Um, are there any like exercises that you give to people who might be like more anxious or avoidant or confused? Um, how, like, is there like an exercise you can give them and be like, okay, this is how you self-regulate. Yeah, no, I mean, there's so many. We could be here all day, Salome. Okay. Um, Give me but... one <laughs> that our right. listeners and viewers can just like after they watch this, they can just practice it in a few minutes and feel that feeling. Yes. So one exercise that I will give people, actually, this is kind of a two in one. We'll do like a bonus. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people are so disconnected with themselves, right? So even just like a really simple three-step exercise that I tell people to do is, and even if you do this like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Like if you're going to forget just a quick check-in to sit with yourself and be like, all right, how am I feeling in this moment? Identify the emotion. Number two, uh, name the corresponding physical sensations because emotions always have a physical counterpart, right? So that kind of helps you sit with in your body. And then number three, how can I care for myself in this moment, right? So if I'm eating lunch and I'm like, hmm, I'm feeling kind of disappointed, that's showing up as kind of a pit in my stomach. What could I do to care for myself right now? I'm going to make myself a cup of hot tea or I'm going to call a friend or whatever. Um, but I really encourage people to put together something called a self-soothing toolkit, right? And this is a list of just really simple things that you enjoy doing. This does not need to be crazy. This could be calling a friend, going for a walk, doing, you know, free yoga video on YouTube, right? And I really, really encourage people to write this down and have it in a journal or have it in a note on their phone. And the reason why is because when you get in that space of maybe feeling really triggered or really down, you're not in a mental headspace to be like, hmm, what could I do for myself right now, right? Like, it's it's not going to happen. So I think having it written down and easily able to access and reference just provides you a lot of um, mental comfort knowing it's there. And then when you feel like, all right, I do want to take a step to care for myself, you have a whole list of things that you can do and pick from because it is going to be so unique for each person. My list is going to look completely different from your list. I love that. I'm totally going to do it. And guys, do it in your phone so you always have it with you. I think that is such a great tip because you're right. Like when you're in the thick of it, you do kind of lose sight of like, what do I need to do for myself? And, you know, sometimes like I'll be running around the house or like running around at work and doing one thing or another and just like in a frenzy and frantic. And then, um, because I've learned a little bit about this, I like catch myself in the mirror. I'll like make eye contact with myself in a mirror and be like, oh, damn. Like, I just let's just acknowledge hi, high five. You're doing great. <laughs> you know, just I that moment that. of acknowledgement is so like soothing and calming to the nervous system. And then that way, and if you have your list of things to do, then you can, you know, like really like lean into that, like self-care moment. I think that you have just given me a whole other facet to self-care. So thank you for that. Of course. I'm so happy it was helpful. Awesome. 
Well, um, where can people find you? I mean, obviously you make amazing reels. I love them. They're so funny. <laughs> You're one of my favorites. Uh, so on, do you want to just share where people can find you and, um, you know, learn about your content and the work that you do? Yeah, totally. So um, you can follow me over on Instagram at Reno Your Relationships. So Reno is R E N O. Um, and my website is renovateyourrelationships.com. Um, and I offer one to one coaching um, if that's something that you're interested in. And I also have my Renovate Your Relationships membership. So that's a very affordable, accessible alternative. If you feel like you don't want to do one-to-one services, it's only $30 a month. Um, and it's month to month. So you can cancel at any time. It's not like, you know, you have to make this huge financial commitment up front. Um, but in that membership, I go a lot deeper on a lot of these topics. Um, and if you kind of want a taste of what's in the full membership, I also have my, my free mini course on how you can kind of create your own relational role model that we briefly um, touched on earlier. So that will kind of give you a really good representation of what the membership is like as well, if you want to try that out. Yeah. By the way, I think the membership is brilliant because you know, not everyone wants to like dive right into like therapy or counseling or coaching. So I think it's a fantastic baby step, whether you're thinking, oh, maybe I do need some help or you're thinking like, I just want to check in with what, where, where I am, like, what's my baseline. So I think that's completely brilliant and very unique to you. So we will include links to all of that in the email and in the show notes. Um, without taking any more of you guys' time, I just want to say thank you, Nicole, for being here with me and having this fantastic conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a blast.